My name is Dr. Katie Marshall. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Zoology here in, at the University of British Columbia, and my pronouns are she, her. So when I was a student, I, or a high school student, I was really interested in studying biology, and I was living in southern Ontario, and I desperately wanted to see the ocean. And so I did my undergraduate at Acadia University, which is in Nova Scotia and we were right on the Bay of Fundy. And so I was really, really excited to spend those four years doing everything from like digging into the mud to get uh, little uh, tiny crustaceans to uh, working in the forest and measuring. Um, I actually did a lot of work on deer flies and horse flies. And I ended up doing an honors degree while I was there uh, in Kejimakujik Park with uh, Dr. Phil Taylor, who was a landscape ecologist. And coming out of that, I really loved working with insects and I found them really fascinating. Um, and I really had enjoyed ecology, but what I wanted to do from there was kind of get a better sense of mechanism. What, what was happening inside of an animal to kind of give the patterns that we saw on the landscape. And so I decided to go to the University of Western Ontario and work with uh, Dr. Brent Sinclair. And so from being an ecologist, I transitioned into being a physiologist. And I spent five years uh, starting in a master's program and then switching to a PhD. And uh, all the time I was studying uh, the, how uh, insects survive the cold. So uh, freeze tolerance, extreme cold tolerance, and really sort of asking these questions of, of that sort of internal mechanism and how, how that might uh, sort of drive where an animal could live. And from there, I thought, well, I really like cold tolerance and freeze tolerance, but I miss the ocean. And so I was lucky enough uh, to get a postdoctoral fellowship to come out here to the University of British Columbia. And I switched over to ecology again. So I was working with uh, Dr. Chris Harley, who's an intertidal community ecologist. And the questions we started asking were, well, in the intertidal zone, it gets really cold in the winter. How do the intertidal animals survive freezing and cold? And I spent uh, three years at UBC as a postdoc doing those things. And then uh, from there, I got my first faculty position. We have quite a few projects going on in the lab right now. Most of them are under the umbrella of cold tolerance. So how is it that organisms survive the cold? What impacts does it have on their ecology and their distribution? And so the biggest one that we have working right now is with the eastern spruce budworm. And this insect is a massive forest pest. It like, when it's uh, growing and feeding, it basically strips the trees of the boreal forest completely bare. It, uh, this is what's called defoliation. And before this happens, it actually has to spend six to eight months overwintering. It can't feed, it can't grow, it can't develop. It has to just be incredibly cold tolerant to sur survive the boreal winter. And so we have a lot of projects looking at the cold tolerance of this animal, how it's evolved over a landscape, how it's evolved um, across these different populations that are found all the way from New Brunswick all the way up into Alaska, so this huge geographical range. Another set of projects we have are around the freeze tolerance of intertidal species. So intertidal organisms can survive ice formation within their bodies. And this is a really interesting thing because so can insects, but it seems like these two sort of capacities to survive freezing have evolved separately in um, mollusks in the intertidal and insects that live in the terrestrial realm. And so we're looking a little bit at how, how does this trait sort of work in this really unique system? What are the molecules that, uh, that intertidal species use to survive freezing? How did um, important uh, proteins like antifreeze proteins that help uh, keep ice crystals kind of manageable, how did they evolve across this group of organisms? So those are the two big projects we have going on. So one of the really common methods in our lab is, uh, it's a little bit of a funny one and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but I think it's really fun. So what you do if you want to measure the freezing point of an animal, how do you think you might do that? Well, you have to cool the animal down until it freezes and then you need a way to detect its freezing. And the sort of strange thing about freezing is that when something freezes, it actually releases heat. This is called the latent heat of crystallization. It's all the liquid water molecules are moving, 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 and when they solidify to ice, all that potential energy from the moving, all that energy has to go somewhere. And so we can actually detect this, and this is a very common method in our field. 
So we take a thermocouple, which is just uh, two strips of metal that um, are two different types of metals. And as a result, you get a movement of electrons from one metal to another. And this is converted into a signal that's uh, relative to the speed of those movements of electrons. And that tells us the temperature of an animal over time. So we stick that to an animal, we put it in a cooling bath, and we can see them in the lab uh, later on. And uh, then we cool the animal down at a controlled rate, and we look for that release of heat. And depending on the size of the animal, you get a huge release of heat. If we're talking a muscle, it might take a couple of hours for that release of heat to be done. Or it might be a little tiny poop bit of heat if it's a really, really tiny little caterpillar that's overwintering. And so this is what we call measuring the supercooling point or uh, measuring the freezing point of an organism. So I had a student um, who was the very first honor student of mine here at UBC. So um, she was an undergraduate student that was doing her honors research project. And she was really interested in muscle freeze tolerance. So how is it that muscles survive freezing? And you know, she had said, well, I'm really interested in these low molecular weight cryoprotectants. So these small molecules that the muscles might accumulate to survive freezing. And I said, well, you know, we know that muscles um, really don't accumulate much sugar or polyol, so I would bet there's not much of an effect. But she like, thought it was a really cool idea and was really interested in it. She's like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And I said, okay, best of luck. I don't think it'll work, but you know, go for it. And uh, you know, she did all these really interesting manipulations. Like if you put a muscle in high salinity seawater, it will accumulate uh, all kinds of osmolites within its cells to balance its osmolarity. And it turns out if you do that, and then you measure how, what's the lowest temperature they can survive freezing at, they become much more freeze tolerant. So that accumulation of osmolites actually acted like a cryoprotectant. Mm. This, I have been working in this field for a decade. I was completely wrong. My student was completely right. And not only was it was surprising, but it was a really cool paper that she ended up being first author um, at the Journal of Experimental Biology. And she absolutely did such a fantastic job that I was surprised, but also extremely happy to be wrong. <laughs> The next step for the spruce budworm work that we've been working on, so we have all of this data right now showing that different populations of spruce budworm accumulate these small molecules, glycerol, um, in response to cold at differing amounts depending on where they, what area of their range they're taken from. So if you're from like the far north, so we have some from the Northwest Territories, they accumulate a lot of glycerol, which makes sense, they have to be more cold tolerant. We also have some from the south of the range in New Brunswick, they accumulate much less glycerol in response to cold. And so we see this evidence for, we think, local adaptation in the ability to produce cryoprotectin. What we don't know is whether this differs, um, whether they differ actually in their ice binding proteins or their antifreeze proteins. And so the very next step that we're going to take is actually measure um, antifreeze protein activity across these different populations. And if we find it's different, then from there we can use techniques like qPCR to measure the expression of the genes that produce those proteins. <laughs> So I started as an ecologist, um, and I wasn't so interested in what was going on inside organisms. And the more I learned about ecology, the more I thought, well, selection happens on the level of the individual, right? And so I need to understand how the individual works to understand ecology. And since that point, so some kind of moving from my undergraduate to my graduate degree, and I had made that transition. I also transitioned back to ecology and then back to physiology. And for me, the two are just so intertwined that I could never just focus on one or the other. And so I guess the biggest thing I've changed my mind on is sort of what is the important level to think about. And I do think as physiologists, we do need to be thinking about these ecological levels, right? What do, is the trait or the protein that we're measuring, does it matter for the fitness of an organism? And vice versa, if we're thinking about ecology, I think understanding mechanism is what helps us make better predictions as to what might happen in the future. So they're all just so hopelessly intertwined, I couldn't possibly pull them apart. And I think that's the biggest thing I've changed my mind on over, over time. I'm a big believer in um, the idea that science is, it's interesting. 
I think people think when they first start doing science and research that it will be like doing an undergraduate lab where you know it's been every possible problem has already been solved and you just follow a protocol and that's it. But for me, science is really, you're doing something new that maybe nobody else in the entire world has ever done. It's gonna be hard, like it is not always easy and you spend a lot of time troubleshooting and sometimes you feel like maybe you're not good at this because like, you know, you're, you're messing up each time or there's something that you're trying to figure out. But I think keep in mind that, that science is about failing and failing again and again and learning sometime, something each time. And so I think the biggest thing that I would suggest to people is that if you are not messing it up or if it's not working perfectly, that means you're doing good science and you're asking a question that nobody has asked before. Mm -hmm.